What's the point of all this? I mean, why? I don't know, sir. I don't think anybody knows. But I do know that someday this war is going to end. Then what? We're soldiers. What happens to us then? Politics in Star Wars had always been a contentious topic. Flying star systems is in dispute. This is the first indication of the tone of the movie. It's fucking boring. Okay, checklist time. Politics, boring. Tick. Even though from one of its very first scenes, it always was meant to have political themes. I'm a member of the Imperial Senate on a diplomatic mission to Alderaan. You are part of the Rebel Alliance and a traitor. Take it away! Yet the original trilogy was structured around the monomyth primarily, specifically on the well-known hero's journey by Joseph Campbell, from which the original trilogy had cultivated from myths and fairy tales. As such, the journey of Luke Skywalker was presented at its core as an optimistic hero tale with a few plot twists and a hint of a tragic backstory. Yet in the Clone Wars series set before the events of the original trilogy, the tragic plot elements were further explored. Before Ahsoka completely tarnished Dave Filoni's reputation, he took from George Lucas's world building with his pre-established political and personal views from Lucas's generational zeitgeist of the Vietnam War and reinterpret them into the Clone Wars for a new generation. In which we will be diving into the Clone Wars' sub-universe of the Star Wars universe for tales of political intrigue and grim tragedy. Ahsoka trusted you and you betrayed her. I've learned that trust is overrated. The only thing the Jedi Council believes in is violence. As the Clone Wars raged on, turmoil bursted the Republic spirit of altruism and liberty. The nature of the Grand Army of the Republic was a promise to its citizens that it was meant to be a temporary military force until the war ended. It made it way more convenient for the Republic so it didn't have to risk volunteering its own citizens. Yet there comes a cost with a conveniently purchased army for its public. Even non-civilians like Jedi Master Pong Krell voices his disdain for the clones. I will not be undermined by creatures bred in some laboratory. Filoni and his writing staff depicted in the Clone Wars series through Padme how the war was ruining many people's lives on both sides. Tekla lives in a district that rarely has electricity and running water as a result of the war. What the people need to survive if not for people like Tekla and her children, who are we fighting for? Whether they come from the clone factories or from any of the thousands of systems loyal to the Republic. But if we continue to impoverish our people, it is not on the battlefield where Dooku will defeat us. Yet the audience can take away from the anti-military subtext for which the Republic nearly went into bankruptcy for ordering more clones and putting the public into the war death. As internal political fighting continued and desperate measures were made, Clovis, who was behind the corruption that almost caused our collapse, in hope of a better tomorrow, we cede control of the banks to the office of the Chancellor of the Galactic Republic. The problem with Padme's push for peace is that it paradoxically creates a push for more conflict in order to end the conflict. If the Republic before the war had the might of its successor, the Empire, and most of the entropy and disarray in the political realm would have been completely averted. Yes, the military might would cause for more war, but they would have been prepared. We must let the wheels of the Senate turn. <laughs> See not what is inside you, dear? I choose not to give you power, and yet you spend your days in the decadence of war. The American economist Thomas Sowell proposed the idea of the conflict of visions. These visions create two separate lines of thinking, the unconstrained vision and the constrained vision on how Gnosticism and realism clash on a political level. The CIS created their own parliament to voice the misrepresentation of the seceded planets. The corporate alliance will never allow this to happen. This is a democracy, and unlike the Republic, corporations do not rule us. While being orchestrated by Count Dooku and the corporations, 
being the Trade Federation, the Techno Union, and the Banking Clan respectively. While the Republic focused more on their central populist collective to support and sustain their democracy, some senators played both sides to profit off of the conflict for their own self-preservation and financial gain. To feed the machine and our profits. After our attack, the chances of peace will disappear. The poor philosophy of Lucas Star Wars is fundamentally the unconstrained vision. Yet in numerous old EU stories, for example, Kodor 2 challenges the fundamental error in this vision. Yet the Clone Wars surprisingly aware or not, bounces between these two visions. I don't like the situation on Pantora one bit. It reminds me far too much of Naboo's unscarred history. It's when things do not go as planned that concerns me. What then? It's when things don't go as planned that we Jedi are at our best. Trust me. I deserve my trust for those who take action. General Skywalker. Another example, the Duchess of Mandalore Satine's political belief in a pacifist government. This form of pacifism led neutral systems that won no part in the Republic CSI conflict. Yet her power was maintained mostly by corruption by her Prime Minister Almec, who dealt with the black market by purchasing drugs that poisoned children and the terrorist cell Death Watch. Throughout the Clone Wars, there have been multiple accounts of seizing Mandalore by Death Watch, with Satine being a victim of assassination and defamation of her pacifist ways. Eventually, Death Watch found a way to win the populace of Mandalore in favor of a utilitarian military government. No! There will be no bloodshed! But, Duchess! Listen, Duchess. Do you hear the people? They cry out for change. Your weak-minded rule of Mandalore is at an end. The resurrection of our warrior past is about to begin. In many ways, Death Watch was right in the situation. These political events all led to her being taken down from the position of power, all to maintain her precious pacifist ideology. I will not be provoked to violence by these terrorists. Aspiring historian What If Altus made a great commentary on how the boomers of the 1960s radically changed America by moving extremely away from anything to do with Nazism. By this line of thinking, just as how people tired to avoid one extreme by embracing another, so too did Tatine try to normalize a radical form of pacifism, yet in the end, her way of Mandalore died with her. I never understood her idealism. We follow orders, but we are not a bunch of unthinking droids! We are men! Trail of the clones in the series as genuine good human beings that Palpatine warped into robotic soldiers by the activation of chips built into our genetic code to make us do whatever someone wants. He even killed the Jedi. It's all in here. As much as I enjoyed your wild theories, Sergeant, the truth is far less complex. But in the old EU, now still legends, there was never an inhibitor ship. The clones knew from the start of Order 66 being one of 150 contingency plans if the Jedi ever assassinated the Chancellor and overthrew the Republic. Back to Coruscant. It was a silent trip. We all knew what was about to happen, what we're about to do. Did we have any doubts? Any private traitorous thoughts? Perhaps, but no one said a word. Not on the flight to Coruscant, not when Order 66 came down, and not when we marched into the Jedi Temple. Not a word. This sadly would fall into how the movies betrayed the clones better. Not as programmed victims, but as soldiers willing to get a job done or not. Especially with the inhibitor chip's existence of, which contradicts the clones' vital purpose, to fight in the name of the Republic, whatever the costs. Even Rex in the Clone Wars said, uh, I've known no other way. It gives us clones all a mixed feeling about the war. Many people wish it never happened. But without it, we clones wouldn't exist. So it's not black and white. It pains me to say this, but in reality, they were no different from their successor, the Stormtrooper. Armed with deadly new weapons, Blazing new ships and shiny new armor. Our presence let the galaxy know that the days of the old Republic were well and truly over. We were establishing a new era. 
an era of order and peace. The Jedi can stop Sidious before it's too late. Too late? For what? The Republic to fall? It already has, and you just can't see it. Arthur Schopenhauer touched on the vital nature of tragedy as an art form that touches the universal side of humans that the Force arguably can be portrayed as. While the particular side of humans that real life will always go through terrible unjust suffering, the core failure of any system of beliefs is demonstrated by both Barris and Maul. The Jedi are the ones responsible for this war. That we've so lost our way that we have become villains in this conflict. That we are the ones that should be put on trial. All of us! Justice is merely the construct of the current power base. A base which, according to my calculations, is about to change. When said system becomes so distorted, it's beyond recognition of what it once was. With the Clone Wars portraying the Republic no longer as a beacon of liberty, but as a military state, implying for a need a resignation, starting from the status quo of democracy becoming unsatisfactory, then to the extreme that it was never good to begin with, so why maintain it? With the Republic being in such a state of impotence from the very start, the Empire seemed like a better alternative. The true tragedy lies in that the Republic was not an inherently good political system that even the show writers and the main author wanted to be. There will never be consensus amongst those who have helped to ascend. They will each differ in their views of what it means to be free. The peace you so desperately seek does not exist. The Republic committed suicide by concern over ideology rather than strong, unified, even militaristic power that would show the galaxy that they could maintain their ideology. Even the New Republic in Ahsoka shows that same weakness. Not from purely ideology alone, but having a massive armed force from all walks in the galaxy that can deal with physical and ideological conflict. The EU New Republic knew this to be true, even as it went through the same problem as the old regime, even in the canon New Republic regime. But there was still a clear power that helped, that helped maintain support. Even Ahsoka in the final episode was willing to join Maul as he was currently hired power in a position of such power that can be trusted not by faith, but strength the will to destroy the new emperor, yet Ahsoka declined out of love and trust for Anakin that he wasn't going to become a pawn of the emperor. Who'd been groomed for his role as my master's new apprentice? You lie. I know Anakin. Your vision is flawed. After defeating Maul, he and Ahsoka were given foresight of Anakin's betrayal. This tragic setup can be compared to another tragedy, Berserk, where the hero of that story fails to predict that their friend will ultimately betray them and lead them to their doom. With this bit of advice, or rather I will foretell your doom. If you think this man your friend, then know this. When you regard one another as brother, and this man's ambition crumbles. It is your destiny to face your death. You cannot escape your fate. When Order 66 fell upon her, she faced that doom that she tried to avoid by capturing Maul, in which Rex managed to accompany her into their He's doom. going down, and those soldiers, my brothers, are willing to die and take you and me along with them. You're a good soldier, Rex. So is every one of those men down there. By the end of this, she saw this and enacted resignation of her ideology to the Jedi and Anakin. This was the strength of the Greek tragedies which Frederick Nietzsche pointed out that people don't want to suffer without purpose. 
They actually like it when they do suffer with purpose. Still, we have a duty, don't we? An obligation to uphold. When we're able. And if you should ever need anything, please contact me. Palpatine didn't make the clones suffer without purpose, though. The Republic did. By its very political and fundamental religious reason, because no one wanted war, and doing such had been forced into it by a declining state as a necessary evil. But we all know that this is a part of a bigger story of Lucas's Star Wars, where all the evil of the past has been undone and all the good has been restored completely and undisputably. If we see the Clone Wars as a self-contained story, we can see it on par with even that of the Greek tragedies, in which it leaves you with a challenge to see if the story was in vain or if you still enjoyed and experienced the best of the story that that does it really need a happy ending like the original trilogy to justify its own existence as a self-contained story? Journeyed out into the cruel world, the same sort of ugly bastards made their presence known everywhere. No matter how many I killed, there was no end. Doesn't matter if it's Artorius, or Ragnarok, or the Christian's Last Judgment. If it's really coming, I just want it to hurry the hell up. It could be anything you want it to be. It's limitless, it's wide open.